Good morning. So good to have you all here as we are finishing up fall break, and I'm glad that you made it uh, back in today. Um, we will not have wonderful Wednesdays um, this week, but we will start that back next week. But before I get into announcements, let's stand and greet one another. Hello. <laughs> So um, the first announcement that I will make is near and dear to my heart. Um, there is a rose in the sanctuary today in honor of a new birth among our family here. My own little grandson, not so little, nine pounds, seven ounces, <laughs> um, Nolan James Leaper. He was born almost exactly this time last week. He was, he was on his way at this moment last week. So we rejoice and thank God for that gift. I also rejoice and thank God for our new grant singer, Caitlin Carroll, who is an MTSU grad student. Welcome. We are so glad that you are here. Um, let's see. Grad boxes. If you get a chance to go by today um, or sometimes in the week, we'll let you in to do it. Uh, the grad boxes are still out in the common room and, you know, put fun little items that our graduates would enjoy in those, and we can mail those in a, in a care package. Our fall festival will be taking place on October 27th. Please look online for an opportunity to sign up and volunteer. We can use volunteers, and we thank you for that. And next week, we will be taking up a special offering for Presbyterian Disaster Assistance. The funds that you give for that special offering, um, which you can do by check or online, will go to the wildfires and uh, the hurricane relief. So we invite you to plan for that special gift. John would have been here, but he is currently uh, getting back from his very good cruise, I understand, good vacation. He got there fine, got off the boat fine, but then his flight home was canceled, so he had to make alternative plans, and he is still traveling. So our hearts and prayers are with him as he makes his way back home. He'll be home this evening. If there are no other announcements, let's prepare our hearts and minds to worship God.
Amen. Would you stand for our call to worship? But now listen, Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. This is what the Lord says. He who made you, who formed you in the womb, and who will help you. Do not be afraid, Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. Let us worship the Lord. You may be seated. It is now our great privilege to come to our God who has called us, who has given us the gift of life, who has given us the gift of God's very spirit to enliven us, who has given us the gift of Jesus to forgive us. It is our privilege to come to him with all we are, with all we've done, with all we've left undone, knowing that he is eager to receive us, he's already forgiven us, and he wants of our sin and the burdens that we carry. So let us go to our God who knows us best and loves us most as we pray the prayer of confession, first in unison and then in the silence of our hearts. Let us pray. Gracious God, the life we enjoy in you came as a free gift, but we play make-believe that we can pay you back as if that is something that you ask for or is even possible. We have turned your gift into a transaction toward the grave from which we were freely saved. But by your grace, we fall only to find that the grave was closed at Jesus' resurrection. Forgive us for striving to repay your gift of life that was earned for us on the cross. Being saved and accepted through your free gift, let us go on following Jesus and overflowing with gratitude. In Jesus' name we pray. Hear the good news. In Christ, our God has come to us, even into our very midst, running down the road to meet us like a loving father. He has embraced us. He has called us his own. By the wonderful grace of Jesus and the love of our Father, we can know with confidence and with assurance that we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me the prayer of illumination. Lord, give us humble, teachable, and obedient hearts that we may receive what you have revealed and do what you have commanded. Amen. The reading today is Psalm 22, verses 1 through 15. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? O oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. 
But I am a worm and not human, scorned by others and despised by the people. All who see me mock at me, they make mouths at me, they shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord, let him deliver, let him rescue the one in whom he delights. Yet it was you who took me from the womb, you kept me safe on my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth, and since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no help, no one to help. Many bulls encircle me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My mouth is dried up like a pot shard, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Our scripture this morning comes from the book of Genesis in the very beginning, chapter 1, verse 1, and then we'll also be reading a little bit from Genesis 2 and Matthew 6. Hear now the word of our Lord. Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day. In the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And then in the meantime, Everything else got created, <laughs> including us. And in Genesis 2, beginning in verse 1, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it... God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. And then in Matthew 6, 9 and 10, we hear the words of Jesus. Pray then this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Loving God, open our minds to hear your word and to know your truth. Open our hearts, our hands, and our whole selves to follow, to live in your way. Help us to receive the good gift of life that you give. Help us to live in your kingdom way, the way of Jesus our Lord. Help us to share the good news of that way with others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Once upon a time, a child was expected. So a place was prepared for the child and everything the child would need to live and grow, was prepared so that the child would have a beautiful life. The child came forth, breathed that first breath, and life began cradled in the parent's loving arms. With great joy and high expectations, the child came, for the child was a manifestation of the parent's love, a part of the parent's own self, set up on the earth, and it was good, very good. And then the life giver took a contented breath, smiled, and rested. Life, new life, <laughs> calls for a little rest. That child might have been my new grandson. That child might have been you. That child might have been me. That child might have been Adam and Eve. God has prepared a place for us, all God's children, to come to life. And God has placed in our earthly nursery everything we need to have life and that to the full, to become all that God has created us to be. We even have the very breath of God who began us on this journey and that is with us even now. We are God's great expression of love a part of God's own life set upon the earth. 
God delights in every one of us and has done since day one. But I really like the way that we started our worship service today. First with the promise of the life that God gives, and then with the reality that sometimes it feels like, my God, why have you forsaken me? God was eagerly expecting us when the cosmos was nothing but a swirling mass of potential. And we were created from God's own self, in God's own presence, an extension of God's life. We were created in God's own image. I mean, talk about potential. <laughs> but what does that mean? What does it mean? What is God's image? What does it mean to be created in God's image? What does it mean, as we're going to read in the end of this uh, sermon in our Confession of Faith, what does it mean to know God and enjoy God forever? Do we even know God? Well, I think you all are on the right track because at least you're trying. <laughs> we're here, right? I was listening to NPR. It's funny how things come to you when you're kind of searching. And a guy that was not a religious leader, but is, uh, had done a study, uh, kind of a sociological, psychological study, and he had written an article, and the name of the article is, A Profession is Not a Personality. And he spoke about the ways in which we've kind of gotten our purpose in being alive and having a life and living, we kind of get it all backwards you know, living for what we can achieve, what we can do. And he's speaking just, you know, from a sociological study, but he does say, we need Sabbath rest. I mean, God knew this early on. Without it, without knowing who God is, I mean, how can we know who we are? Somewhere along the line, it seems like we've lost our true identity as that extension of God's own self in the world. Persons created for life. Pers persons that God loves and has given life and gives life day by day. And then maybe it happened when we decided that we had to not just enjoy God, but we needed to be God. We need to create our own life. We need to build our own towers. We need to grab our own apples and fruit and satisfaction and get from the world what we can grab. And God kind of gets left aside in all that, doesn't he? I mean, we feel like we have to grow up. I think God intends us to grow up, by the way. But what my mother would say is, I think we got a little bit too big for our britches thinking that we could be our own little gods of our own little kingdoms. And we get so focused on being large and in charge that we forget to know God, to enjoy God, to receive the life that God has given, to be connected in real communion to God and to one another. We begin to focus on the burdens that are on our shoulders, and there are many. And, of course, we create more. With all that working and controlling and achieving and dominating, who has time to rest in God's presence, much less know who God is and who we are? And what's the point anyway? We don't have time. Again, I say, I'm preaching to the choir. You're here. You know there's a point. <laughs> but even when you know, even when you know that God loves us and made us, it's hard. It's hard to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. It's hard to believe that all the rest is going to be at added unto you when you are saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And don't feel bad about saying that. Jesus said that. He quoted that from the cross while he was still loving us. That is a high standard to meet. I've always thought that really young children 
young children that are provided with all they need. That's not always the case. But when that is the case, when young children come into this world, into welcoming spaces and places and welcoming arms, I feel like maybe they get to have a little bit of Eden, you know? They're living in the delight of the moment. Union and communion with their loved one, that's their first priority. We may give them a whole lot of toys, but really what they want is us. Really what they want is love. Really what they want is that connection. My first child, if we ever moved from place, point A to point B, I, I pretty much had to take a moving van. There were so many things I felt we had to have. <laughs> By my second one, I knew we just need a diaper. That's all we need. A diaper and me and Timothy. But the worries of the world, they can really encroach on our ability to remember we are God's children. Eden fades away. Henry David Thoreau says the world is too much with us now and we just end up carrying that world on our shoulders. We think it's ours to carry. As I was thinking about, can I give an example of when this transition takes place, I thought about my dear, dear father-in-law who passed away about a year ago. Most godly person you'll ever know. I'm sure that he did live in delight until the day that he passed away. However, he was of this earth, like we all are. And one time we had a conversation that illustrates what I'm talking about. Because he had, he had kind of, he didn't get married until he was like 40. And he worked hard, but in the midst of his free time, he hopped trains, he went dancing, he had a good old time. You know, he has some time to enjoy life. And so he had a long and good marriage and Timothy, you know, uh, his son and I got married. And one day when I had some children and all was well and we got to talking and he was kind of a philosopher. And he said, yeah, you know, Joyce, he said, I really hated to see Timmy get married. And I am saying, and he said, no, don't get me wrong. If he's going to have to get married, you're the best he could do. Now, that, that, you're, you couldn't find a better woman. But he said, but you know, when you get married, your life is over. <laughs> we've, we've all laughed at that, because I know he knew his life wasn't over, but I get the point. You're, you're all grown up. You've got to leave it all behind and put those burdens on your shoulder. It's the good thing to do. It's the right thing to do. I think it's an illustration of how sometimes we see the world. We can't be both righteous and happy. Sometimes I think we take Jesus' call to pray, Thy kingdom come, to mean... Hurry up and let this world in so that we can get to the next one. Because this one is a suffering mess and we just got to tough it out, nose to the grindstone, and then we'll get a reward. Brian McLaren, a theologian, says, We have made the announcement of the reign of God into an evacuation plan into another world. I feel like while I do look forward to the fulfillment of the kingdom to come. Don't get me wrong. But I feel like if that's all we're looking at, we're missing out on the kingdom that has come near that Jesus spoke to us about when he was here and speaks to us about now. I feel like we might be selling God's kingdom short just a little bit. So what does it mean when we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Jesus taught more about this than any other single topic, especially in the book of Matthew. I would encourage you to read Matthew, especially chapters 5 through 8, where he describes what life in the kingdom, what it really is, not what the religious establishment had kind of turned it into, as I think our prayer of confession said, a transaction, you know, a bunch of rules that we got to live up to. Uh, the kingdom of God with the Spirit of God as God intended. 
And uh, Matthew 5 through 8 are challenging, but they're also reassuring. The kingdom of God is bigger than the religious establishment. It's deeper, says Jesus. In fact, in Matthew 5, 20, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, and these were the most you know, devout folks, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Of course, that didn't win Jesus any brownie points with those folks. But Jesus went on teaching and healing and trying to help us to understand what God has created us for. The image of God that we are created in. He said, uh, the kingdom is like a man that goes out in his field and he sows seed and he tells the parable of the sower. And the people of that day would have been aghast that this farmer is out there throwing seed on hard ground and throwing seed in the weeds, but then some of the seed he throws in the soil, they would have been astonished that it produced a hundredfold because nobody produced a hundredfold. Jesus is making a point. God is generous. And where God's kingdom takes hold, oh my goodness, there's life. And there's more life. Exponential life. In the same theme, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. Or like yeast, the woman put in her three measures of flour and all of it was impacted. It was raised, was, was leavened. Many, many times we hear him saying the kingdom is like this. It's like this. It's living. It's dynamic. It's growing. It's, it's transforming whatever it touches. And as Jesus went out doing that very thing, healing, touching, transforming, he would say the kingdom has come near. Repent and believe the kingdom has come near. In this healing, know that the kingdom has come to you. In fact, the reign of the kingdom of God was Jesus' main theme. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have his inaugural address with Jesus saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And we've seized on repent, and it's a good thing because we all need to repent. But a lot of times we think of repent as, you know, Oh, shucks. You know, I just, I'm no good, and... And, and that's really true, you know, but what repent really means is change your mind. Change your perspective. Jesus came saying, the good news is the kingdom is breaking out. You need to rethink, you know, you've been oppressed, but you're looking at this all wrong. And to show you how he meant for us to change... Matthew 18, 3, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. He also said, and this was hard to hear, Truly I tell you, it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. And in Matthew 20, the last will be first, and the first will be last. And in Matthew 21, tax collectors and prostitutes are going into the kingdom ahead of you. What is he talking about? This is really upside down from the way we see the world. I mean, and the disciples were concerned. You know, read the story over the rich young ruler. He was a, not a bad guy. He had done everything right. And Jesus loved him, it says, in one of the narratives of that story. And he said, hey, I'll show you what it's really all about. And rich young, the rich young ruler couldn't do it. I always like to think that he came back and changed his mind later, but that's, you know, that's just me. <laughs> but when that happened and Jesus said, it's going to be so hard. You know, it's like a camel going through the eye of the needle. And his disciples said, well, then there's no hope. Who can be saved if this is the way? And, of course, Jesus said, well, not with man. It's not possible. We're not going to earn our way there. But with God, all things are possible. It's a change, a repentance, a metatonia, a turning around in the way that we understand, really, reality. 
Jesus came as our do-over, as our start again, as Paul called him, the second Adam. Um, Jesus came bringing us that brand new second chance. He told um, Nicodemus, you need to be reborn. You need this restart from the inside out, from your spirit. Your core needs to be coming from a different place if you will be living out God's image in you. Jesus was the one person that did that, that never turned away from God's way. And Jesus said, here it is. You know, come to me. This is the way. He lived out God's way in the midst of the fallen world. Jesus operated from the core of love. The love that started it all. The love that was God that started the whole thing. The reason there is a universe. The reason there is a you. The reason there is a me. Love that started it all, incarnate in Jesus, that God would have to be, that God created to be, incarnate in us. This love is sort of like yeast you put into dough and it, it impacts everything. It's like seeds planted in a ground who make the huge increase. It's like living and transforming like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field, the smallest of all seeds, but when it's grown, it's the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make their nest in its branches. The mustard seed in that place was a common weed. It was also a healing weed. It was one of those things that had healing properties. And it was a little tiny seed, as we know, that grew into a shrub that was big enough for other life to come and, and live in and join. And Jesus said, that's what it's like. Just the seed, the littlest seed is planted and life just explodes. And you can't stop it. That weed won't stop growing. It just keeps popping up. You know, we, we have a lot that we deal with. In the world, sometimes we say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But there's that weed growing right up in the middle of the pavement. Likewise, love is hardy and tenacious, and it doesn't stop because of aggravation or persecution or division or hate. Again, as Paul says, love never ends. The kingdom is not so much where you go as it is where you come from. When love is our core, when love is our motivation and our main objective, then the kingdom is breaking out within and among us. We can't get back to Eden in this lifetime. We can't go back, as Nicodemus said, in our mother's womb and start over there either. But Jesus has brought the kingdom to us to live within and among us where he said it was. In Jesus, God's kingdom has come. God's will has been done on earth as it is in heaven. And it is even now living and growing and transforming within and among us until the day that it is one day fulfilled. But even here, this is the kingdom we are to embrace, that we are born for, that we are created for. Jesus never failed to come from that sacred core of love despite aggravation, persecution, division, hatred, betrayal, death on a cross. Even when he was saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was doing it out of love for those who were crucifying him. That's powerful. That's not little soft hearts. That's, that's the love that created us. Okay. 
Love is why Nolan is here. Love is why you're here. Where all of you are here. Love is why I'm here. Love is why Jesus has come and is here. Whenever and wherever we live out of that core of real love, we get a glimpse of God's kingdom. We get to experience moments of delight for which we were created. And sometimes when y'all are together, you should share those moments. They come in the funniest places, don't they? In the oddest times. And you know, oh, this is good. Life is good. But for me, recently, you can guess where I might get a glimpse. Watching the unconditional love of a parent and a child is a nice glimpse of God's kingdom come. New life. It's tough. It's scary. It's also wonderful. Even when it's not wonderful, it's still kind of wonderful. When Timothy and I were brand new parents, our little son, we just were so delighted at everything he did. We were delighted at every diaper he soiled. We were delighted at every, everything. And it, you know, it didn't have to be delightful. It was delightful to us. And he couldn't do much. <laughs> just a little baby that cries and poops and sleeps and eats. Timothy opened up his diaper to change his diaper for the first time, probably ever in Timothy's life he'd ever changed a diaper. And he was, I don't know if I should say baptized, but anointed <laughs> with the spray of urine that came into his face and splashed off his glasses. And do you know how that made us feel? We were delighted. We were absolutely delighted. The same thing happened recently with little Nolan and his dad. And do you know how he felt? He was delighted. <laughs> Isn't it nuts? But that's how God loves us. We do wrong things, silly things, but God knows. He knows us in our core. and He knows why we are created. And God loves us. God has loved us and delighted in us since day one. God loves us right where we are. God loves us where we're going and all that he knows that is within us. God's going to provide us whatever we need to become fully the people we're created to be. In fact, he's already done it and he is doing it. Jesus is his name. Until we are fully formed and we know God and God sees us and we see one another face to face in the fullness of God's life and love in God's kingdom. And the good news is the formation and the delight can begin and does begin right here and now. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. I invite you to stand and say what it is we believe. It's the confession of faith from the Westminster Shorter Catechism. You'll find it in your bulletin. What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. What rule hath God given to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy Him? The Word of God, which is contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, is the only rule to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy Him. What do the scriptures principally teach? The scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. You may be seated. The Lord be with you. 
Let us pray. Loving God, holy God, creator God, thank you for giving us life. Thank you for going through it with us, even to the point of the suffering that we suffer. Help us to remember that you are here for us, even when it feels like you're not. Help us to remember to seek you first. Help us to live as children in your image. Transform us from the inside out so that the love that you have put in this world, the love of Jesus, the very person and life of Jesus the Christ lives in us, within us, among us, and through us. We thank you for the gift, and we thank you that there's nothing we can do to earn it, but help us to receive it with minds and arms and hands and hearts wide open, and help us to give it to all who you give us to love. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who taught us about love and taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you stand for the benediction? So we have been the church gathered. We have come because we know that there's more to life than what we can make, achieve, and do ourselves. We know that we need communion with God who loves us most of all. We need connection to one another. And so I pray that you will open your whole selves as you go forth to receive the love that God gives and then to share it wherever you go. You're like, you're like leavening. You're like, you're like weeds. Grow like weeds everywhere you go. Love like that. You can't stop that kind of love. And for our benediction, I'm going to have you to turn to someone beside you and repeat after me. Ready? God loves you. And there's nothing you can do about it. Amen. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Yeah.